is the novel dead in 2024? Because if it is, then we just need to give up now. We need to sit and grill and chill and listen to baseball and football podcasts when it's not football and baseball season and then just melt away. And I don't talk about Philip Roth very often on this channel. I made a couple videos on him four or five years ago. But in the latter 20th century, I would probably put him in the top 10 for American novelists. And I like Roth because he is a bit more pessimistic about the writing life and about the world than a lot of other authors are. I, I heard a story from one of my professors who, when he was young, like in the 1980s, w went to a reading by Roth and said, hey, I want to be a writer. And he was like, don't do it. And my professor thought it was a joke. And then Roth was like, no, seriously, like, are you trying to do this? Like, are, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm going to school right now. And he was like, make sure to get a PhD and teach because you don't want to be a novelist, a full-time novelist. And so that's an interesting approach. And as we're going to hear today, he has a pretty pessimistic view about things. But the whole point of right conscious is to kind of flip the script, to take this these nuggets of wisdom from previous authors, even if they are pessimistic, find what's true in them, and then figure out how we can make a change. And enough for me, let us hear from Roth and then we can explicate further on this. I was being optimistic about 25 years, really. I think it's going to be cultic. I think pe always people will be reading them, and he's talking about novels, but it will be a small group of people. Maybe more people than now read Latin poetry, but somewhere in that range. To read a novel requires a certain amount of concentration, focus, devotion to the reading. If you read a novel in more than two weeks, you don't really read the novel, really. So you think that that kind of concentration and focus and attentiveness is hard to come by. It's hard to find huge numbers of people, large numbers of people, significant numbers of people who have those qualities. And, you know, I have spoken almost endlessly about people losing focus and concentration and that stuff in regards to literature. Like, I'm not going to sit and repeat things I've said countless times on this channel. But there is a new piece of wisdom there that I think we should focus on. And that's when Roth says, to read a novel requires a certain amount of concentration, focus, and devotion. If you read a novel in more than two weeks, you don't really read the novel. And this is an interesting note because a lot of us, first of all, are juggling multiple books at once. A lot of us have lives and find it really hard to find the time to read. And even worse, it seems like there are a lot more 800-page novels in my life right now than 200-page novels. Not everything is the Sunset Limited. So we've all had that experience where we sit down on a summer's day or have nothing to do and we just blow through a novel. And it does feel like a movie. And a lot of Roth's books, from what I know, don't run over 400 pages. Like, I remember I sat down and read American Pastoral in one day. Like, I just wanted to know what was going to happen. But I could also say that none of Roth's books are challenging in the sense of having to read them. They are challenging in the concepts and how they stress me out. Like in Amer American Pastoral, I was just like stressed out and the rise and fall of characters and the themes like that. And that's what makes him a great writer. But Infinite Jest, for instance, is hard to read. Gravity's Rainbow is hard to read. And there are times when you're going to be frustrated and have to take a break. And, you're re and reading 10 pages may take 30 or 40 minutes. And that's all the time you have for the day. And you still have 960 pages to go. And when I look at novels, though, like Infinite Jest, Gravity's Rainbow, 2066, um, William T. Volman novels, they are never one story. They're hard, but they are never just this kind of one chronological line of characters who we are following. And speaking of those novels, we are currently reading them. We're about to start all of them in the Right Conscious Book Club. Right here, you see... Just some of the novels we are going to currently start reading, which include Moby Dick, Gravity's Rainbow, Infinite Jest, um, three Cormac McCarthy novels, Roberto Bolaño, Haruki Murakami. And you don't have to read all of the novel, but there is no book club online that reads more difficult novels than the and impactful novels than the Right Conscious Book Club. And so if you've always wanted to finish Infinite Jest, Gravity's Rainbow, Cormac McCarthy's books and some certified American classics, you should come over. And I also host daily office hours, have course material on a lot of these books, have a writing group, and so much more. The link is down in the description below if you are interested. And let's get back to the video. And so it actually, I don't feel that concept in these novels because I never actually feel in it. I'm just being thrown into confusion and into different scenarios all the time. And so I can come back and be like, oh, I'm back with this group of people. But we also need to look outside of ourselves in regards to the novel. Because here we are. We read 
Philip Roth and Cormac McCarthy and Toni Morrison, and we're the smart people. We're the highfalutin literary fiction people. But I know, because I have a lot of my students who are into this, there is a culture in Japan where certain authors write like 700,000 word novels, post them online, and they eventually get a big following. They eventually, maybe they start off for free, but they start to gain intellectual property, maybe get to develop into a manga, a TV show, uh, sell merch or do these other things. And it becomes a big deal and people go crazy over this. And what we have in something akin to this with fan fiction and Wattpad and genre fiction and stuff like that in America. Once again, we think the loss of literary fiction and the reader of literary fiction means a total loss in reading. But what is really being lost is maybe more of the care of the contemplation of some of these deeper, some of the more deeper order of thinking in terms of reality. Because in a even genre novel, even a romance novel, or one of these Japanese novels, and I've read some of them, you get to explore the full range of, range of human emotions, sometimes just as good as Philip Roth. Sorry, Philip. And it's so important that we have this class and we take these people seriously and don't make fun of them too much because they aren't like Rupi Carr. Like Rupi Carr sits and writes a poem and any, any idiot in the world can understand a four-line poem. I could give it to like a basically illiterate grease monkey who's never read in his life and he'd be like, yeah, whoa, that's cool. But the book talkers, these people, they are experiencing, as I just said, in general, the same range of emotions and characters that we get in a typical story and have the concentration to sit down and read the book. We talk about ADHD brain and all these things. I have female students who are depressed, probably on meds, don't care maybe about these big issues in life or all this stuff, but they sit down and they read books. They read more than I do. But just how a lot of you guys maybe weren't intellectual at some point in your life, if the people, the guardians at the gate are poo-pooing you and telling you that you're, a, that you're an idiot and all these things, then are you willing? Are you going to be willing to go into their zone? Are you going to be willing to put in the time and the effort to hit the next next stage? Excuse me, of concentration and more importantly, contemplation. And that's what we have failed as a community to do. And I'm throwing Philip Roth in there and a lot of other authors because they act like their story is enough. They act like we should be worshiping them, but in actuality, they should be telling us what themes, what philosophies. D does their novel connect to or something? Yeah. Like if you read Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian and you were nudged in the right direction, you could start exploring Wittgenstein, Nietzsche, Kant, Peirce. I mean, Schelling. I mean, the list is endless. And McCarthy made certain that all their philosophies were embedded in the novel. If you go to the Cormac McCarthy archive, he was reading them all while writing Blood Meridian. And so if someone watches a Windy Goon video or hears that there's this Blood Meridian novel and that's all they hear, they're going to go and read it and they're like, damn, that was really violent and all that stuff. But it's just another Western novel until you realize or start contemplating or looking deeper on Reddit, on a channel like this or whatever for something more. And these old novelists, this, this old guard, they, the reclusives, you know, Roth, McCarthy, Pinchon, Don DeLillo, they were sons of the, gen, you know, this long lineage of writers who were in general elitists. You go back to anyone who was writing, you know, and there are exceptions like Walt Whitman, who kind of made himself a writer and others, but go back to the 19th century, especially the 18th, 17th century, before the printing press, most people were illiterate. And so you were writing to the aristocracy. You know, I think of Dostoevsky when what, his first novel, Poor People, he suddenly is elevated, even though he wasn't a poor person, he was suddenly a part of the upper echelon of Russian society. Then that was the same for most writers. You know, Emily Dickinson, Dickinson, excuse me, had a powerful father. And many authors, including Philip Roth, Cormac McCarthy, David Foster Wallace, Thomas Pinchon, came from a background that was very intellectual, go, going to great universities, having professors as parents, and being surrounded by really smart people from a young age. And so they were also somewhat embedded with this elitist attitude with that they don't need to interact with kind of the lowly public. They don't need to make these random people care. And eventually it's almost like capitalism or even communism or whatever economic system. We've been eating ourselves alive. We've been sustaining ourselves and like living in this golden age and now it's gone and now everyone's complaining like, what do we do? I, I don't have a random slush pile to send my stuff to. Like no one reads me. No one's here to support me. When the entire time we never actually made an effort to reach the entire global population and tell them why they should care. And if you guys want to learn how to do this 
for free. I run a free writing school, which teaches you how to build your reading audience, how to write better prose, poetry, how to overcome writer's block, and how to start a meditation practice to help you as an author, all for free over here on school.com. I'm about to launch this very soon. And as you see, we already have a lot of people waiting. And so if you'd like to get on the waiting list, the link is down in the description below, and it won't be much longer until all the courses and the community launch. If you look at the marketing of a movie or of a music video, if you look how rappers or musicians or directors and actors, artists even, promote their stuff, they actually believe in it a lot more. David Lynch refuses to talk about his films and like the meanings of them, but he's written two books about how to be creative. He's given countless talks. So you could go down the David Lynch rabbit hole and learn everything you need to know about why you should care about him, why you should be interested in him, and why you should be interested in other films. Like he turned me on to so many other random films. Here I am. The whole point of Write Conscious, I mean, you know, up until this point, outside of like the writing content, has been to be a spokesperson for Cormac McCarthy and all these other people because they refuse to do it. Because we're weird. I am ambitious and odd about all things in my life. I want to film 10 videos a day. When I do something, I go crazy with it. And so when I heard that there were books like Infinite Jest, Gravity's Rainbow, that there were levels to the game, like I wanted to get involved, like I wanted to do it. I didn't need anyone to make me care. The challenge itself made me care. Knowing that people were smarter than me made me competitive. I was like, no, I got to go read all these philosophers now. Most people aren't like that, but there is an incentive for the future of humanity to at least help people reach a certain baseline level of intelligence. Can a democracy even exist if people don't read, if people aren't intelligent? Right now, we just, our democracy is a bunch of people who are easy, easily manipulated, who can't control their anger or their emotions or even critically think, critically think. There can't be a threat to democracy when it doesn't exist. So it's not the concentration. It's not the focus. It's not the attentiveness. It's People not caring because what if you sat down, how would you sell reading Hegel's phenomenology of the spirit to a random housewife who doesn't care about reading and just wants to, you know, stay at home and have a fun time with her kids? How do you sell reading Ayn Rand to a liberal? How do you sell reading Derrida or Foucault to a, a staunch Christian conservative? How do you make them care? Because it's important. How much richer of an intellectual life would that housewife's kids have if she did maybe contemplate some philosophy, maybe not read Hegel, but, you know, did take self-education and maybe um, Rudolf Steiner's The Waldorf School or, you know, stuff like that seriously. If liberals sat down and read John Galt's speech and understood Atlas Shrugged, some of their shit would get put in check. Same as if a bunch of conservatives and Christians read post actually read postmodernists with an open mind and all these preconceived notions, it would be so good for them. But we don't have anyone that crosses borders, borders anymore with, within groups. There is no one who tells you know, conservatives and Christians, hey guys, the secret weapon, like the hidden shadow of your entire philosophy about anti-government and stuff is Foucault, is Derrida. If you learn them and learn about Lacan, they will help you tear down anything. If you apply their system to any aspect of reality, deconstruction, it will help you. But then you're going to be Isn't it a bunch of French gay men. Jordan Pearson said not to read. Then if you tell a bunch of liberals about Ayn Rand, which would help them put in check some of their utopianism ambition and realize how most Americans outside of cities feel and actually care about them and their philosophy and to not pass these crazy spending bills, but to focus and really dial down on what really matters and win those battles. They would say, well, Ayn Rand was on meth. She's a bigot and a racist and all this stuff. And so it takes a certain somebody, it takes, you know, a glutton for pain to walk into those scenarios and they have to be open-minded to do that. And I don't know if that's possible anymore. We've killed the idea of the hero. We've killed the idea of the Bodhisattva because of polarization who can walk into these different groups and hand them pieces of knowledge that they internally know that are their internal shadow, but just haven't manifested yet. So the novel isn't dead. It's alive and kicking. Tens of thousands of authors, on, novelists on Kindle who write mostly in genre fiction are making a full-time living, are making more money than you right now. Yes, tens of thousands of people. They have attentive audiences, but we have to figure out how to bridge that gap to help them care about our more literary fiction ambitions. And it starts with you believing in what you are, you are doing and understanding that the old ways are gone. It's, it's over. And so it's funny, like I'm, I see a comment right here. I've written three novels in the last 10 years. No one wants to read them. Yet you cry talking about me. Cry about where have all the writers gone? 
There are plenty of writers. In my creative writing club at the high school I teach at, I have 15-year-old girls who have people who care about their writing because they post online and network and market. 15 years old. You don't have anyone who is reading your stuff, then that's on you. And I understand there's an education gap and like an ignorance gap that has been created because we, people haven't really learned or talked about how to be an author in this new world. And that's what I'm here to do for free with you guys over on the school. And I hope to see you guys over there and in my other videos. Let me know your comments down below and have a great day.